All right, everybody, we're back. This is the Recovery Lab podcast series. I'm Drew Hassan. I'm Daniel Anderson. And today's guest is Bernard Mathern. Hey, hey Bernard. Ryan. What's up, brother? Oh, man, all well. How are you all guys right. doing? Doing well, doing well, doing Let well. Let me get through our little introductory spiel. So uh, I thank everybody for their help and input. Uh, the comment section is not as great as I wish that it was, but the we'll comments there. That, yeah. Uh, we want to increase the uh, exchange, the number of exchanges, post things that are beneficial for people in recovery. If you know where you can get free Narcan, let everybody know. Uh, the general idea is that the less ba- the less bashful we all are about being in recovery, the more better it will be for the community at large. You know, as we can decrease shame and embarrassment, we increase recovery and help. Uh, because, I mean, there are people dying out there still every day. Every single day. Every single day. If we can do, if we can help one person, then it's I mean, all worth it. You know, my cousin messaged me last night, and she said, would you mind if I gave your number to somebody? And I was like, of course not. And she just told me a brief story about some 20-year-old kid that had you know, gone off the deep end. Their dad was out there looking for him, and I thought, thank God. That's, you know, that's not me, and that's my, not my father today. Right. Absolutely. Uh, but if we can talk more about these things, we can help more people. Uh, I know that you can get free Narcan always from Mr. Moore's Bike Shop in Hattiesburg. Mr. Moore's quite the force of recovery. He's a great person. The Pines usually gives it away. Uh, Christina Dent and Angela Mallett's place end it for good. You can find that resource on uh, Facebook. Um, look, you can also go to our website, recoverylabllc.com, and buy – some of the best looking hoodies I've ever seen in my whole life. I mean, we say it every week, but we say they it every are week. Probably the finest, and and everything is handmade in um, Switzerland, also, which is amazing. Swiss hoodies, Swiss you know, hoodies, yeah, absolutely. So go check them out. Yeah, I put mine on yesterday, and I thought you look twenty five and like an Olympic weightlifter. Yeah, I sleep <laughs> and take a shower in mine right. every day. It's uh, warm in the winter, cool in the summer. Right. It's, <laughs> you can't beat it's it. magical, really. Yeah, Harry uh, Potter. Yeah, it, absolutely. It's a perfect well, look, We still have it. some hoodies left. Please, y'all buy them so that we're not stuck with them. And spread the word and make sure you send us a picture of yourself wearing the hoodie, and we'll put it on our website. Absolutely. Also, we can't continue on without thanking all of our Patreon uh, subscribers. Uh, we've had quite a few uh, this week and we're really really grateful for you guys for doing that and you know a promise that we will have is we will we will continue to to uh to upload quality content for you guys that are subscribing so some behind the scenes maybe absolutely so thank you so much for your support all right as i say every time without further ado nobody wants to hear me bernard thank you so much for giving of your time man i appreciate it oh Sorry. i'm excited to be here and appreciate the invite <laughs> absolutely absolutely well, I generally have a kind of set list of questions for people that I know that are in recovery, but Daniel wrote some bang up ones. Why don't you fire one off, buddy? Well, let's, I'd, I'd like to, if we could, um, go about 15, 20 minutes of just your kind of story. Uh, if you wanted to go a little bit longer than that or a little bit less than that, that's totally cool. I but, hit him with that a little while ago. Yeah, I was like, yeah. I think we've let people talk about their shenanigans for too long. Yeah, yeah. And not gotten to the good part. Yeah, so let's, let's do 15, 20 minutes or so, and then we'll hop into these questions if that works for you. Hey, I'm, I'm flexible. All right, what sounds need, great. Man. Awesome, awesome. And also, congratulations on 40 years of 40 sobriety. Years. That's, thank you, thank that's you. That's wicked awesome. Well, I wicked can't awesome. take much credit for it. Understood, know. understood. But it's still pretty amazing. Thank so. you. Thank All you. right. Floor is yours, sir. Great, great. Well, you know, uh, as I was driving up here, um, it allowed me an opportunity <coughs> to really reflect. Uh, gosh, it's been 40 years ago since I've been in the pits of addiction, and uh, it's easy to forget the details. It's easy to uh, forget what it was like back then because recovery has been so joyous and, and, uh, and fulfilling. Um, <coughs> but, um, yeah, when I, when I tell my story, I, I really – give an overview of of what addiction took me to uh i like to focus more on recovery because i think more people have questions about how do you sober up how do you live without what you depended on for so long uh, day in and day out so uh, i'll start off with saying that you know um i did not have a disruptive upbringing Uh, i was born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana, in that area, and uh, 
raised by two parents who remained married until my mother passed uh, last year. Um, and uh, But what I do remember is from as early on as I can recall, I walked around with a lot of fear. I was just scared of life. I was scared of everyone in it. And uh, never truly felt comfortable in my own skin. Um, and when I was 12 years old, um, you know, I began drinking. Uh, you know, the culture that I grew up in, alcohol was much a part of it. So I had opportunities to take a beer here and a beer there when my parents had friends over. Um, uh, got in the smoking pot when I was 12 as well. And I, I just recall when I was under the influence, like many of you who go to 12-step meetings, um, I felt different. I felt comfortable in my own skin. Um, and so I proceeded to try to stay that way as much often as and as much as possible. Um, it worked. Yeah, yeah, it sure did. It sure did. Unfortunately, the price uh, increased. Uh, there was tremendous inflation <laughs> and addiction uh, because I wasn't old enough to purchase my own drugs, so I had to find ways to get money. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, not proud to say that, you know, that involved you know, breaking the law and hurting people uh, to fund my addiction. And uh, I just remember the the shame and the, the reputation that I developed uh, because of that, and uh, just couldn't couldn't see a way out. Um, you know, uh, I, I remember my dad, who was a pretty stern man, that you know uh, always told me what was right or wrong, and uh, it tore him up to see me do some of the things I did. And, uh, you know, he and I had a pretty tumultuous relationship then. And, you know, I was so out of my mind uh, towards the end of my addiction that um, uh, he and I used to hunt a lot in Mississippi. And uh, I remember one morning he dropped me off at the stand and, you know, he had been really trying to interfere with what I thought I needed to survive. And uh, in my... Uh, insane thinking um i put a crosshair to the back of his head uh, with my scope uh with my finger on the trigger as he was walking away thinking you know if i just pull this trigger he'll be out of my way and i could do what i want and uh gosh reflecting on that after all these years uh it is hard to imagine being in that mindset today but it was very real then and uh it was a tough thing to uh, get honest with him about in my ninth step uh, when I went through treatment and, you know, uh, working the steps with a sponsor. And I remember thinking, man, he's never going to treat me the same way. But, you know. Did beautiful. you tell him the, the story? I did. I did. Because I, when I did my fifth step, um, the uh, uh, member of the clergy who heard it, who was a really cool guy. He'd have never thought he was a member of Mickey? the clergy. Uh, no, this guy was in Baton Rouge, oh, okay. which is where I was in treatment. And, uh, you know, he said, you know what you got to do. Huh? I said, yeah, I know. I know. That's the only way I'll be able to forgive myself. And he needed to know if he was going to take me hunting again, um, what I ha was capable of. So, you know, uh, as many have experienced, it was nothing like I imagined it would be. Um, of course, it hurt him, but he was happy that I was honest with him. And, you know, the the miracles of the program is, you know, he ended up being my best man at, at my wedding. And, you know, he's my friend today. And, uh, you know, uh, beautiful transformation, you know. And so if, uh, it's one of several examples of my experience where I thought there was no way I could face this. There's no way I could be honest about this. Um, but as you guys know, you know, God does wonderful things with uh, what we used to be shameful about and turns it into uh, nuggets for other people that are that are trying to stay sober. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, long story short, I uh, my dad had always um, told me that if I ever bought drugs in his house, he would called the police on me and sure enough in my 
drunken stupor and carelessness. He needed to test him on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I knew he was serious, but I thought I could conceal it appropriately, but uh, I was wrong. And, and really, that's what precipitated me going into treatment. I got arrested. I got in trouble, you know, with the juvenile justice system. And uh, unbeknown to me at the time, my dad and the judge in the back room made a deal before I was presented in front of the judge and allowed me to go to treatment. So um, I ended up in treatment for about nine months. And uh, I'll tell you, I needed every every day of it. Mm-hmm. So, did you go to treatment in Louisiana? I did. Okay. I did. I went to a primary treatment program in Algiers, Louisiana on a naval base. Um, and it was for an adult. It was an adult facility, but they allowed me to go in. And, uh, and then they referred me to a place called the Adolescent Residential Center in Baton Rouge, who is, you know, they're no longer open, but that's really where I got sober. Um, it allowed me to take those risks, become more of who I am, and I experienced that, you know, when I could be myself and I could be authentic, people won't reject me. They'll love me through it. And, uh, you know, I made some really uh, wonderful bonds with the other folks that I was in treatment with. And uh, really, that's what springboarded me into recovery. Um, I finally began to feel good about me without having to take a drug. And uh, I was desperate for that. So... Uh, I hung on to it and protected it as much as I could. So after nine months of treatment, went back to New Orleans and just uh, jumped right into AA. And uh, there was a club down there called the Camel Club in Algiers. It's similar to, you know, uh, Yana here in in town. And um, went to a meeting every day because I didn't know what else to do. Um, And, uh, you know, got a sponsor. Um reluctantly worked the steps, you know, because I, I wanted to be sober, but I didn't want to look at myself too much. Right. Uh, but fortunately, you know, the old timers uh, kept kept me focused. And, uh, you know, uh, it's been a lifelong experience since then, you know. Um, met my wife in uh, 90, 1990. And uh, ended up marrying her in 92, and you know, we've got three kids and uh, three grandchildren, and, you know, uh, frequently I recall how grateful I am to know that they never have to meet Bernard and what I'm capable of right. in addiction. So, uh, um, so you know, it's... Uh, it's been a journey, that's for sure. It's been a journey. And uh, I wish I could tell you that um, that it was all smooth sailing. Uh, you know, I mean, life still happens even though we get sober. And uh, the beautiful thing is, is recovery shows us how to uh, respond accordingly when life happens. So uh, got back to New Orleans, uh, finished school, uh, wasn't ready to go to college, so, you know, I started working, and uh, my dad helped me get a job with a friend of his who owned a um, land surveying company, so I was a lineman for a land surveying company, and a uh, year and a half sober, July 3rd of 1984, um, truck ran over me in our work site, and uh, for the next six months, um, I really experienced the power of the AA Fellowship. Um, they pumped me with a lot of, a lot of opioids. Um, I was lucky to live, uh, into ICU on a ventilator, um, and took six months of repair, eventually lost my arm to amputation. And, uh, I was told that in the, um, in the hospital, uh, in the emergency room and the ICU waiting area, uh, there were more recovering alcoholics in there lining up to give me blood um, than there was my own family members. And I was hospitalized about three miles from where I grew up. So I tell you, AA stepped up, and I was so glad that first year and a half of, uh, you know, showing up, being known, establishing relationships, because those guys and women, you know, came to my uh, 
to my aid. Uh, had AA meetings in my hospital room and, you know, just an awful lot of support. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I surely haven't uh, had the success I've had in recovery because of me. I was just willing to show up and suit up and let people support me. And really the process kind of unfolded on its own. You know, I remember when I first got sober, it was mind-boggling to me how working those 12 steps on the wall could change me. Just couldn't comprehend it. Doesn't seem like anything impressive. Just some words on the wall. Um, but what I know now is is uh, just trust the process. Just allow people to help you and uh, be willing to help others. Um, and something changes in your heart. Something changed in my heart to where, uh, you know, recovery is my life passion, uh, both for me and my family, but for those that I help and the uh, profession that I'm in. Well, I think you've been in that profession the, the entire time I've ever known you, which is a hot minute now. Um, how, did you, how did you get to Mississippi and get to be uh, in, the, in the therapy game? Well, um, two years before I moved up here, my dad was transferred to Mississippi with his job, and I would come up and visit and just fell in love with the area. Um, I liked to fish and hunt, and again, we hunted in Mississippi, so um, although I grew up in the New Orleans area, I'm not much of a city guy, so I really didn't have anything keeping me in Louisiana, so uh, I moved up here uh, in 87, October 1 in 80, of 87, Went to college for a couple of years, still wasn't real serious about it. Um, and my sponsor one day um, mentioned to me that there was an opening at the Baptist CDU, the Baptist Hospital back in the day, uh, for a substance, use tech, substance abuse tech, and uh, asked me if I wanted to go interview with the executive director. That's right. Director. They were called SATs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I uh, oh, said, man. sure, man, I need to make a little money, and uh, I need to do something productive. So I went to talk to uh, Mary Ross. I Mary know, Ross. Mary Ross. Yeah. A blast from the past. And uh, so they hired me, and uh, a couple years later, they asked me if I wanted to uh, uh, be a part of the counselor training program. And I said, sure, why not? The rest is history, you know. Thirty-two years later, I'm still helping folks uh, discover themselves and find a new path of recovery. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right. Um, so, I guess when one one of the questions was, uh, was there a crisis that sparked your uh, recovery journey? Was there something? And it sounds like you've already answered that. That there wasn't necessarily something that was a traumatic experience that kind of kicked things off for you. Was or do you feel like you were predestined for addiction and, and a life of, of mischief? Or was there something specific um, that, that caused you to, to really um, reach out to drugs and alcohol as a solution to who you are? You know, 40 years later, I have a much different view of that compared to if you were asking me that question in a year or five years in recovery. Uh, what I know now is, is I definitely had an anxiety disorder that I didn't know about, didn't understand it, and I don't think many people did back in the day. Right. Um, um, and, and that's what really motivated me to drink and drug as much as I could, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, and throughout that period of time, I was bullied in school and, you know, some other traumatic things that happened that um, I had a hard time dealing with. Right. And... Uh, so uh, that's why today I'm an advocate of uh, really helping people explore their entire background, you know, right, and absolutely. addressing some of those traumas. Um, so uh, yeah, that's looking back on it now. That it was really I was treating an untreated anxiety disorder with some with some unresolved traumas. Right, and so the the drugs and alcohol were a solution. They worked for a for a good while. Oh, that, sure. Right. Yeah, they did. Right. And, and I thought they were still working when I was uprooted and sent to treatment because right. I wasn't a willing participant. Right. I mean, I wasn't stupid. Sure. Treatment's better than jail. Yeah. You know, that's why I agree. But it wasn't because I had <laughs> taken step one and recognized my powerlessness and unmanageability. Right. That came later. 
Right. Understood. Okay. Um, did you ever lose hope when you were drinking and using? Um, if so, uh, what helped you to break free from those feelings? In other words, did you ever, were you ever um, just so lost emotionally um, that the, the only options were to do something different or to basically unalive yourself? Were you ever at that point? And what did you do? Did you listen to people? Did you, what did you do to get out of that? Well, I'll tell you, Danny, uh, I never experienced it when I was using because, as you mentioned, the chemicals did the job. Right. I actually experienced that in early recovery of not really dealing with all of my emotional trauma. Tell us a little about that. Well, you know, I'm a young guy. uh, I get sober. I can't drink and drug anymore, you know, and so what a lot of us young guys do is get into relationships and, you know... uh, She'll yeah. fix it. Huh? She'll, she'll fix, fix it. She'll right. fix it. Sex will do it. You know, it's a substitute, uh, unbeknown to me at the time. And, uh, you know, just, um, again, looking back and, in, in retrospect, um, uh, I still had a lack of, uh, self identity. I still had a lack of, um, uh, self confidence, and so, of course, I placed a lot of my well-being on other people and the relationships. And when it went south, uh, I contemplated taking my life. Right. Um, and so, you know, just because I stopped drinking and drugging really didn't stop the emotional turmoil. Right. Uh, I had to continue to address that. And thank God I didn't pull that, you know, trigger. Right. Uh, when, when I contemplated it. Well, you like they like we always say, you know, don't quit five minutes before the miracle happens. You know, a lot of times, it's, and it was true for me in early sobriety too. You know, um, some sometimes life is is really, really, really hard, and it's important for us to just to just sit in that that pain and anguish and don't lose hope because you know one day you could be Bernard sitting with forty years sobriety and helping countless people. So. It's important. Don't ever give up. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Amen. Um, okay. Um, all right. So getting, getting into your past just a little bit. Um, a lot of times, you know, we, we, you know, the program teaches about, um, not wanting to shut the door on the past, not regretting the past, nor wanting to shut the door on it. Um, and, and how important it is to, to kind of forgive yourself and, and move on and, use your past experiences to, to be able to then, as you said earlier, nuggets of, of, of things that you can use to, to help other people. So my question is this, is there anything that, that, um, that you struggle with today that, um, your heart is just still kind of holding on to that it's, that you're, you're not, you're not able to forgive yourself for, or is there, is there anything that, that you haven't forgiven yourself for, or are you at peace with your past and able to completely use it to help other people's at, other people at this point? Yeah. Great question. Um, you know, I, I really do not have any more shame or guilt about my past. Um, in fact, not that I'm proud of some of the things I've done cause I surely am not, of course, but I understand that it's a part of me. It's a part of what I was capable of. It's a part of, of the devastation that addiction brought me. And I, God has allowed me to use it as a gift. And so for that reason, I'm pretty okay with it. Right. Now, could I wish I could go back and change some things? You bet. Um, again, I'm not, I've, I've forgiven myself, but there are, you know, two or three situations where I hurt people that I didn't know that I couldn't go back and make amends to. And so that still comes to mind from time to time. Sure. But basically, you know, I tell my story in AA and I usually tell it all. Right. Because again, there is that person out there that's full of shame. That's like me. And a lot of us said at some point in time, I'm taking this to the grave. Um, and maybe if they hear me share something that I once thought the same, they're willing to share it and take that risk and release that burden. Look, I think that's beautiful. I mean, one of the real motivating Shame factors. Is so powerful. 
uh, for for having the podcast is if we're on here being real honest about the, our mistakes and problems and where we struggle and we can convince guests to be equally as transparent the next man can say look i i fucked up just like that that's you right know? I, I did those exact same things i thought crazy things i did crazy things and if we can help somebody make not make even one of the horrible life decisions I've made. I'm sure he's made too. Absolutely. Then it's all worthwhile. Sure is. Absolutely. What a, what a great, yeah, that's a great way to look at things. I mean, I've, I've learned from being in recovery. We won't truly get to some measure of victory, if you will, unless we can find a way to make profitable our mistakes. You know, what good can I have out of this? How can I help the next man? I mean, I think that's really the underlying philosophical basis of the, you know, step 12 is, you know, what, you know, I can't change it. I might as well get something good out of it. Mm-hmm. Right. And it starts with the, with the ability to forgive yourself. That's, that's where, when you can forgive yourself, shame doesn't have anywhere to grasp on. So when, when you, when you work through the forgiveness of yourself for, for being a shit person, um, when you can start to work on that and truly forgive yourself, then like I said, shame doesn't have anywhere to grasp onto. And shame is so unbelievably powerful. I don't think that, that a lot of people understand just what kind of a grasp shame can have on us and how it can affect every aspect of our life. So it's important to begin that process of forgiving yourself. So then you can slowly get away from that shame and eventually get to a point like you're speaking of that, you know, shame doesn't have a place in your in your who you are today right um it it was a driving factor in your history and and helped you to to um, get to certain points that you wouldn't have gotten to otherwise but now as a result of that pain and that anguish that shame produced you're now able to move past that and use that so very much so and and i didn't do that on my own of course i mean the old saying we'll love you until you learn how to love yourself right i mean that was true for me you know, other alcoholics who liked that I was there, who welcomed me, who who looked forward to seeing me. Genuinely uh, cared about you. Genuinely cared about me. It was the first time I felt like I belonged somewhere. Right. Without a, a drug. Right. With, <laughs> in an AA meeting. And so, you know, um, I, I can't emphasize that enough. The power of the fellowship uh, gave me the gifts that I now have to extend that to another suffering alcoholic. Absolutely. Yeah. The net, the, the follow up I have about this is this kind of a multi part. I want you to think for a second about uh, reflect on your life and concept, uh, you know, even in abstract terms, we can talk about it. So it's not completely personal, but think about some real problem you've had since you've been sober. Uh, inner family conflict, job conflict. I mean, something that is reflective of the general human condition. You know, your kids are acting up, your wife won't do right, whatever it is. How do you approach problem solving today? Good wow. question. Yeah, really good question. Um, you know, I, I, I mentioned one, a year and a half sober going through the accident and really having to deal with a lot of change in my life. Um, oh, were you on opiates before that? You mentioned opiates. I was a, I was a year and a half sober. Well, I mean, it, it, in, it, I, recreationally, did, was opiates part of your thing? No, it was mostly benzodiazepines, marijuana, alcohol, and amphetamines. Well, um, but Everything like, else. <laughs> everything else. But, but did I like it when they gave it to me? Yeah, you, you did. You betcha. Yeah. You betcha. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> You know, you betcha. I um, think this thing's broken. Yeah. <laughs> That's not working. Yeah, you know, as I mentioned earlier, even though I got sober, life still happens. You know, I mean, uh, we, uh, but to answer your question, yes. I mean, I've, I've had cancer. I'm a cancer survivor. My wife is currently being treated for cancer. Uh, a couple of years ago, my one of my sisters committed suicide uh, because of depression. Um you know, like I said, I lost my mom last year. Um, so there's there's a lot of things, a lot of challenges, like everyone else. Um, I guess for me, and, and not that 
you know, I don't want you guys to think that I just breezed right by it with no problems. Um, but I never tried to deal with it myself. I still have to talk about how I feel. I still have to talk about what conflicts me, even though I'm praying and even though I'm trying to practice the principles in my life, I need to pick up the phone and say, Hey, I'm hurting today or I'm pissed today or, you know, I'm just struggling. And, uh, uh, just take it a day at a time. You know, I know it's a cliche, but really if I can just live through today and get to my bed and get a good night's sleep, then I got another shot at it tomorrow. Right. You know, my mindset generally leans towards finding a formula. I, you know, I, I think I have this, this need for certainty and I know if I can just do this, 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 and this, then I'll have the outcome that I want. And I think that I look, I ask people similar questions to this because I genuinely, genuinely want to know like what it is they do. How do you employ a, an successful response to undesired circumstances? And it sounds like the first thing is benefit from having stayed plugged into the recovery community. Correct. I mean, you can't reach out and talk to people unless you've got people to reach out and talk to. Exactly. Uh, and I think the other thing too, Drew, is is this is going to sound really weird to some of you, but I embrace feelings. I embrace challenges because I know that they're going to happen. It's when I try to fight against it and try to avoid it or try to stomp my feet and say, why me? I shouldn't have to be dealing with this. That's where much of my difficulty comes in. But when I accept it and embrace it and say, okay, this has happened. This is how I feel about it. I'm just going to kind of let it play out day to day. Did that come easy for you? Like I've got this love hate thing for emotions and vulnerability. And I think it, I think they're pointless. (laughs) I think they are a hotbed of problems and, you know, nobody ever said, gosh, if I had only been more emotional when I made that decision. Uh, so I, I've got the, you know, I'm still, you know, I've been at trying to be sober for a long time and, I have just, I've, I, I'm pretty good at accepting that I feel a certain emotion. And I certainly try to tell myself it's okay to feel that way. But I, I loathe having it have an impact on what I do because I just find it so unreliable, such a mm-hmm. an irrational uh, measurement of life. How, how do you reconcile those things? Well, I... I I identify it for what it is like I, I and feel what it's not. This it's, thing has made me feel insecure. This, this is how has I made feel. me feel fearful. This is how I feel. Doesn't mean that my thinking shuts off. It's all information. Okay. So this is how I feel. I allow it to come out when it needs to come out. But I think the difference is in comparison to my past is today I can respond to it. In the past, I used to react to it mm-hmm. and that's two entirely separate things. I like that. Yeah. Um, you know, I know that if I allow myself to own and feel what I feel, then it's just going to wash over me. If I try to avoid it, it's going to stay with me. And it's always knocking on the back of my head, and it's going to influence my behavior. When I'm angry at my wife and I don't tell her about it, and I don't address the issue, it's going to come out sideways. But, for instance, not that I do that a lot, um, but if I acknowledge it and, and say, hey, look, this is how I'm feeling. The situation may not change, but this is kind of where I am. Then somehow it takes the power away and it takes the energy away from it. So it hasn't happened overnight. It's uh, 40 years in the making, you know, and I'm not saying I'm perfect at it, but it sure is a lot easier now than than early recovery for sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's Recovery's really, a practice, isn't it? As much as anything else. Very much so. Very much so. I love that responding instead of reacting. That's incredibly important and something that I am still very acutely aware of. I am not a master of being reactionary versus right. Professional life I'm I'm pretty good, but personal life uh I've got a lot of work to do. 
Ooh, this is a good one. Go on. Well, hang on. Let me back. Let me go circle back. I don't want to shortchange you. So we're working through a life problem. First thing is you stay plugged in. You reach out to people that you think are trusted advisors. Then what? What's your go-to? You go to a meeting, boom. I read the Bible, boom. I read the 24 hours, boom. I I, I, I use a lot of mindfulness these days. Uh, I meditate a lot. Meditation. Yeah. Uh, that keeps me grounded. Um, you know, the prayer. They make apps for that. Yeah. What what they is do. what yeah. does meditation look like? It's such a generalized term. What for you, what for Bernard, what does meditation entail? What does that look like? Um, well, and I actually use an app. Um, <laughs> uh, but it it really is time for me to just focus on my breathing, try to clear my head as much as possible, fixate my attention on a particular sound or smell or just a sensation of breathing um, and um, just trying to practice as much as I can to focus on the here and now. And that's not only the 15 or 20 minutes that I do it in the morning, but I try to practice that throughout the day. So I catch myself trying to rush through things like preparing a meal or eating or taking a shower. And so what I'm trying to practice is to slow that down some and just savor the moment, you know, pay attention to the food and the aroma, and the texture, and, you know, uh, things of that nature. It's very Thich Nhat Hanh-ish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And it helps. It, it really keeps me from dwelling in the future. I don't typically have issues dwelling in the past. Um, my f- When I'm not in the here and now, I'm usually somehow trying to project the future and that creates a lot of anxiety for me. And so I find that since I've been putting forth more um, of a concerted effort to be mindful, uh, that really has improved. It's a good answer. The mindfulness movement seems to have worked itself into recovery Absolutely. pretty well. It, 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 it showed up and it's pretty popular. Mm-hmm. Very much Is so. the general idea like uh, say I've got this, you know, bug a bear out here, this thing that is causing me emotional turmoil, mental anguish. The general idea of mindfulness is to recognize that right this moment, that thing is not bothering me. I'm here. I'm okay. These are questions. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, yes. Uh, I think it serves multiple um, uh, factors. Uh, one is is just to reset the central nervous system is what I'm learning. Ah. Um, you know, I've, I've been trained in trauma and helping others with trauma and, and you know, learning a lot about trauma uh, for my, you know, personal uh, benefit. And what, I, what I'm learning is is that when someone um, has unresolved trauma, the central nervous system remains on guard. It remains hyper vigilant, um, and so there's this low level of on edge anxiety, tension, waiting this, for this the primal to protective response. Very much so. Very much so. Yeah, this is so fascinating. Zed Thompson, that was on the podcast, yeah, great guy, spoke at length about because I was hitting him with a lot of questions uh, about what do you tell that brand new person. And he kept going back to, I would tell them, you know, to focus on their body. And it was really interesting how he walked me through this relationship between the mind and the body and how that relationship gets distorted because of addiction or uh, as he was reflecting on uh, post-traumatic stress and codependency. And it's really fascinating. I, I think people in recovery can benefit from contemplating these kinds of things. Yeah, and it's not an attempt to avoid what you're experiencing, again, it's allowing you without judgment to embrace it and just be aware of it. And there's something about just accepting its presence and inviting it in that takes the distress away. 
you know, because I think head and body is one and the same, you know, and I, and, and the longer that I stay sober and the more that I learn, uh, to help others, you know, with, with trauma backgrounds, um, the more I'm realizing that, um, you have to take a holistic approach to recovery. Uh, you cannot carve one piece of yourself out and address it without addressing everything else that comes with it, whether that be diet, exercise, mindfulness work, you know, and, and, you know, th- what I've shared with clients is that, you know, our body is a barometer. When it's hungry, it will tell it will tell us. When it's thirsty, it will tell us as well. When we're lonely, we will know it as well because of the physiological experience of that of that emotion or that need, that unmet need. And so, um, you know, if, if, if I'm allowing myself to experience myself holistically, um, then I'm much more aware. And what research has shown is the more we can train our minds in the here and now, it actually changes brain chemistry. It actually helps to develop new uh, neural pathways in the brain that somehow are advantageous for well-being and good health, et cetera. I need to know more about all this. I mean, who doesn't need healthier pathways? Speaking of healthier pathways, what do you think is the most rewarding aspect of your work? You know, early on in, in recovery, before I figured out what I wanted to do with my life, um, the thing I did know was whatever it is, I wanted to somehow make a difference. It had to be purposeful. And um, what better way to um, find purpose uh, than to, you know, help others with some of the struggles that I've had. And so very early on when I started, when I was introduced to the counseling profession, I knew this is me. This is going to be my lifelong um, professional journey. Um, and I just really love it. You know, I really do. I, I love having people on the other side of the room. I mean, it's a privilege to, to hear their vulnerability and to to watch them struggle and to to really engage with them and give them options to move through that in the healthiest way they can um i mean the thing with 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 addiction is tell me another disease that doesn't impact society across the board legally health-wise child services financially and so Every person that sobers up, society is much better off for it. And so that's what keeps me motivated even after all of these years. Because sometimes it's trying. It really is. Uh, It's hard work sometimes to watch the pain in someone else and how it affects me and trying to remain, you know, healthily detached, if you will. Uh, Yeah, certainly, as with most other healthcare providers that we've spoken to i'm curious what you do to con- to combat the following how do you not take it home with you and then how do you we'll, we'll just start, let's stay there sure. how, do, how do you i know it's easy to want to invest in somebody and then when they double down on their misery by not taking your advice and i know it's got to be aggravating <laughs> and then when they die I know that's got to be defeating. And how do you maintain, how do you stay upright? Well, I wish I could tell you that I'd never take it home because I'd be lying if I did. Um, But what I try to remind myself uh, is that every person that I come in contact with has the right to remain sick if they so choose. Oh, that's a tough reality to... to, And that is tough. Do they teach you that in... Like I've wondered how, how do counselors approach the uh, the notion that 
not everyone is going to do what we suggest and not everyone is going to get on board with the good advice that everybody knows would work. I mean, well, uh, what, how do they, how do they tell y'all to, uh, to approach that particular component of the therapeutic relationship? I don't, I, I never really learned that in school. I, I really learned more of that from my mentors that kind of took me under their wings in the practical part yeah, of your education. Part. Yeah. yeah, very much so. And, um, uh, you know, the, the, the bottom line is, is some people aren't ready to move away from what seems to be working for them, for what's protecting them. Even though it might be killing them, they still see that I'm not willing to give this up yet because I'm too scared about what's going to happen when I do. Um, I just, you know, really just tr- have to remind myself that just because I want someone to change doesn't mean it's going to happen. Well, like I was talking to you about up there before we came in here about my brick wall analogy to or or patchwork quilt uh, analogy about my belief system. Mm -hmm. And I can look back on things that I've learned from previous counselors that I had that, I mean, once I made the connection between their advice and uh, application to my present circumstances I, apparently it you know it it made it onto the hard drive it didn't have any immediate impact but later on for example I had this one therapist who I'd go in there and I'd be like you know this and that and wife and mom and dad and blah 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 blah, blah. and she would invariably ask me well, what happened the week before and I, I get it now you know what what led up to your reaction to this uh, uh, stimulus here? And then later on, when I kind of put two and two together about where she was going with that, I thought, damn, that's pretty, that's pretty good advice. Uh, and, and I was always taught that, you know, uh, gosh, so many times my mentors would mention, Bernard, we're here just to plant seeds. Yes. We're not in the results business. Yeah. The yield may not happen in front of your eyes, but that doesn't mean it won't happen. Yeah. You know, it's a brick in the right. brick wall. Exactly. One of many. And, and that was true with me. I mean, it's a, it was a long, it, it continues to be a lifelong process. So, uh, unfortunately some people, uh, die from it and, uh, never want to hear that report, you know, but it hurts. It really does. But, uh, that's just the ugly reality of of, uh, of this illness that uh, some people will not survive it, and uh, a lot of people do survive it, and a lot of people do recover from it. So I have to balance that out with all of the different lives that have been changed um, as a result of a new way of living. That's good stuff. You got any questions? Um, have we gone over all the questions? No, there are more. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So, is there is there anything that um, is not necessarily common knowledge right now about drug addiction, alcoholism, um, that you wish were common knowledge? Like, is there anything that, if only everyone understood this one thing? folks in recovery would have an easier job or uh, getting sober would be an easier task or something like that. Is there anything that you wish was common knowledge? Oh, gosh. Uh, that's a big question. Um, I guess the thing that comes to mind is some of what I touched on earlier, and that is recovery is more than just stopping drinking and drugging. It's more than um, going to meetings. It's more than getting a sponsor and all those things that we're taught to do. Um, It is a holistic process of healing, of spiritual growth, psychological growth. Um, And I've come across a lot of people, and I used to believe this as well, that, well, at least I'm not drinking and drugging and kind of, 
minimized or um, discarded maybe some other issues in their life, um, only to find later on that it may have motivated a relapse or it may have motivated a crisis in their life uh, that they wish they hadn't experienced. Um, I would just like to offer that, you know, be willing to look under every stone. Be willing to look at all behavior and anything that is counterproductive to what they want to achieve in life. Um, I would like to add, too, the thing that really pisses me off is this legalization of marijuana. You know, I get it. You don't want to put people in prison for marijuana, but um, there is a growing belief in society, in my opinion, that somehow it's a cure-all. Somehow it's not as bad as anything else or other drugs. You know, and we've always believed that in, in society. It's not a real drug like uh, opioids or, you know, uh, other things. But um, it has a lot of negative impact, sure. especially the potency of the marijuana these days. So, uh, Look, I didn't smoke weed for a long time. And then I relapsed and started, and I was like, wow. It's pretty this, incredible. This, this isn't what I had in high school. Right, you're right. You're exactly right. Yeah, it's not your granddad's Look, pot. are you familiar with the drug called, hold please. This was, uh, they may call it Za. Yeah, yeah. They call it, I think the. Ten. Yeah. Ten. Uh, Tianeptine. Tianeptine, that's correct. The, what what is that? Uh well the the nickname of it is gas station heroin is what it is. It's a, uh, you know, I, I really, Was this like Kratom's big brother? Uh, you know, I, I don't know the details of the molecular structure, but it is a mood altering drug. Are you seeing it in your practice? Very much so. Really? Very much so. More often than you might imagine. Really? Um yeah, kratom, tianeptine, um, and it really can mess you up. It really can. Uh, it could really uh, create some physical problems and some psychological problems um, that um, a lot of people have struggled with. And um, I really wish that our legislature would do a better job at passing laws to cover those loopholes. Because well, he just interviewed. Yeah, I, I spoke with Representative uh, Lee Yancey on, when was that? Last week sometime. Tuesday, maybe, at the um, at the uh, Capitol. And they are working on, you know, they're, they're working on, A, making it more difficult to get a hold of Kratom. Um, he wants to get, he personally wants to get Kratom out of gas stations at the very least. Um, he's, he's got quite a, quite a bit of, of kickback. Because people that take Kratom on a regular basis don't want to be told that they can't take Kratom on a regular basis. And I understand that. But Lee is, is trying to, um, he, he's doing good work. You know, whether you, um, whether you want Kratom in the gas station or not, he's trying to get it out of the gas station so kids can't get a hold of it. He doesn't have a problem with you ordering it online. If that's what you want to do, fine. Um, but he's he's working on legislation to to be able to uh, make things a little bit better for for be for folks not to be able to obtain things like that that you can at a gas station. I mean, really, there's you can get you can you can serve just about any high on a, on a you know decent level at at pretty much every gas station. So yeah. uh, he's he's working on that. Um, Good for him. One one thing that and we got about five minutes left. Um, I was at a speaker meeting last night, a speak and eat, and um, the gentleman that was uh, giving his story was talking about how he had been to 18 rehabs. Um, so taking a step back, and we've, we've talked about the, the alcoholic and the addict that you work with. Um, let's, let's not forget that this is a family disease and that families are affected by this disease just as much, if not more, if the actual person that's struggling with the addiction what would you say to someone, a family member who has been through the ringer with their loved one, has tried countless rehabs, nothing seems to work, they get sober for a little bit and then go back out, and quite frankly, they're losing hope. They are, they are very ready to give up on this individual and just kick him to the curb. 
from your 40 years of experience in with with uh, recovery as well as your professional experience dealing with alcoholics and addicts on a daily basis, what would you tell that family member that is at their wits end that is ready to give up about their loved one? Sure. I, I, the first thing I would want to say is, is that to acknowledge that family members are traumatized by loved ones who are addicted. Just the fear of them not being okay or getting that phone call in the middle of the night and wanting so much for that individual to, to get better. Um, work your own program. Get the help that you need. As Speaking to the family member. member. Yeah, as a family member, get the help you need um, because you have been affected. And I think that once that family member gets support and deals with the, the emotional issues around that, um, it's never easy, but at least they're able to better care for themselves. And what I've seen countless times is a misconception that the family member believes that as long as my loved one who is addicted gets better, then we'll be okay. And that's simply not the truth. Right. Um, again, family members who go through what they go through with folks like us have been traumatized. Well, it was either Zed or do you know Keenan Wald from Columbus, the Columbus area? I'm familiar with the name. Well, Keenan's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Top notch. Either Zed or Keenan said, look, if the drug addict is happy with the family member, they're probably enabling. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and if they're not happy, right. they're probably setting healthy boundaries. Right. Yeah. Look, don't if your child has a drug addiction problem and you give them money, you're part of the problem. Right. Very much. So. Let's just be honest about right. it. Right. Yeah. And also yeah. Brad Garraway with uh, Clear Path Interventions yeah. was talking about this. Oh, maybe it was thing. Brad that I think said it was that. Brad, yeah. yeah. Uh, talking about how important it is for him to not only talk with that the addict that's, you know, struggling, but how unbelievably important it is to inform and educate the family members. And that's where, you know, interventions really, really shine. So I want, I want folks to, to hear what you just said and also to understand um, what it looks like to, to work your own program and to, you know, relinquish, you know, trying to control this person and work your own program. And there are resources available for those people that are struggling, the family members that are struggling, um, you know, you can reach out. We, we have resources on our website at uh, recoverylabllc.com. Um, you can reach out there. Also, um, for family members or addicts that are, are struggling, uh, is there any way that they can get in touch with you or for your, uh, how can they get in yeah, touch with you? Yeah, yeah, look, I'll, I'll give you, well, there's two ways they can get a hold of me. Okay. Uh, I work at a bridge to recovery. I'm a therapist there, and we do offer services for both the addicted individual as well as family members. So they can reach me there at 601-977-9353. Or you can reach me on my cell, uh, 601-209-3289. That's 601-209-3289. Three two eight nine. It's very kind of you to offer that. That's that's really amazing. Look, right. As we close, let me let me say this. I tried to get Costas on the podcast, yeah. and she's refused. So maybe yeah. you could shame her. Into oh, God. <laughs> as wonderful as Costas is, she just does not <laughs> want to be in the spotlight, and I get it. I get it. So, uh, but yeah, she's a she's a very neat individual, and has helped a whole lot of folks. Over She's here. great. Yeah, She's she great. Really is. And I, I will say this, I will also add um, Bridge to Recovery to the resources list on the Thank website. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. Yeah, we'll be able to, is it okay if I put the your phone number on? It sure is. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sure right. is. I'll do that. All right. Well, I think we're about out of time. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and I've enjoyed it guys. I really have. Thank you very much for allowing me to, you know, reflect on the past a little bit. Absolutely. Well, we're great. Just don't want to stay there. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. We do not want to stay there. All right. Thank you so much, Bernard.